Uh, good morning, my name is Laura Valodieste, and this presentation is about the relationship between language, grammar, and cognition. This branch of linguistics uh, is concerned with how the human mind stores and processes language, and it is called cognitive linguistics. This framework is a collection of approaches to language, and it was developed in the late 1970s mainly by Lakoff, Langaka, and Talmi. You have the different approaches which follow this framework and the figure on the right. There are three main branches, conceptual structuring system, inventory-based approaches, and grammaticalization. These approaches have several assumptions in common. They are called cognitive because they study how the human mind represents the word through language. Thus, um, language is considered an instrument to organize our knowledge of the world. If the primary function of language is categorization, knowing a language is fundamentally semantic in nature. It roots from experience and it shapes our interpretation of the world. This interpretation of language comes from Saussure, who postulated a symbolic system any linguistic unit is considered a pairing of form and meaning. So it has two poles, the sound, word or gesture, and the meaning. These are psychological entities since they belong to the mind. The root is a usage event. It is a, a situation of language use. Okay, so if knowledge of a language is semantic, then there is an inventory of symbolic units that conform a language. We have on the one hand linguistic units, such as apple. Um, on the other hand, relationships between these units and schemas. Schemas are grammatical forms such as passive, independent of the specific words that fit the construction. Schemas are formed by generalization, so it is based on frequency. If a new instance of a word can be categorized into an existing schema, then the word is considered well-formed. We move now to construction grammar, which is a cognitive approach to grammar. Um, here, a symbolic unit is called construction. The main difference with the other approaches is that constructions must be learned. The most typical example is an idiomatic expression such as face the music. However, constructions are also schemas such as the more the better. Like other schemas, constructions are stored in the mind and the more we hear them, the more data we have. So we can tell whether an innovation can be included into the cluster of construction or not. For example, Take these two dots in the figure below. Can you tell whether they can be grouped together? No. But what about now? Frequency is key, but also distribution and variability. Our mind stores all of this. However, it doesn't matter if the instance fits into the existing construction if there is a competing alternative with more frequency. Take, for example, third. It would make mo more sense to say three, as in fourth or fifth, but third is more frequent. And we want to conform to our community conventions, so we use third. What else do we know about language? From slips of the tone, such as pull the feel instead of feel the pull, we know that language planning comes before production. Again, frequency is important for mind processes, as, uh, for example, red is easier to access in our mind than amaranth, which is another word for red. We know that our memory is associative and that we parse sentences to process them. We process them from top to bottom and we tend to avoid creating a new syntactic node. 
garden path sentences such as this one force us to redo our cognitive processes. And this is the end of my presentation.